think for me, one of the big highlights of this year's ICMA is that India was out there. This was our ICMA. This was the most relevant ICMA for India by far. Indian two-wheeler makers are the biggest brand ambassador globally in terms of make in India. I mean, our bikes are appreciated in Africa, Latin America. But now you see them, you know, fighting with big boys in Europe and US. I think that's a matter of pride. Mid-sized motorcycles are here to rule and beautifully, most of them are made in India. It's amazing to see whenever you travel overseas and you see, even on motorbans, you see mid-sized motorcycle. It's amazing to see a Royal Enfield being ridden on those roads. I got to say though, the surprise and probably the highlight of the show for me was the BMW 450. Oh yes. Welcome to Deep Drive, our weekly podcast powered by Kotak Mahindra Prime. I'm Ketan Thakkar. And I am Rishad Modi and we're here to talk about bikes again. Finally, uh, after a long time, yes, Rishad, always exciting to talk about the world of two-wheelers. Uh, and this time around, we're going to be talking about Aikma. Yeah, uh, it? Aikma is just, I really look forward to Aikma. World's greatest motorcycle show, I think it's not uh, an exaggeration to say that. Uh, I've been there four or five times now and it's if you're a motorcyclist it's it's not even a business show it's just an amazing place to go and see everything related to the world of motorcycles you have seen this show for a lot longer than i have what 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 do you think about it you know frankly rishad the uh, i see lot many car shows then bike shows and uh, whenever an opportunity comes along uh, to visit aikma it is just different energy it's just different excitement uh, there's so much of cool caution there, you know, I mean, I was just telling my friends about uh, the experience recently. I mean, you do go around the world and uh, you do see uh, executives in their suits and, uh, you know, really uh, in a formal avatar. Here you are seeing, you know, uh, executives walking around in their jackets and cool uh, attire. I mean, what's amazing to me is uh, the crowd. I mean, uh, so many cafes, yeah. there's live music being played. And there's so much of a, so much of excitement in the air, and it's it's it's, it's uh, you know you got to be there to feel it. And um, I really have really come back uh, energized, um, and it was fun experience. Uh, I was there for two days. I was uh, I had to fly back on the third uh, day, but uh, I was so keen to spend another day and absorb a lot more from the right. environment there. Right. You know, I my experience with like or with motorcycles in general. I started off in this industry as a car guy, and I went to international events and. You no, know, you've got your suit and tie on. And the right. first motorcycle event I went for, I was so overdressed. People were in shorts and t-shirts and it was very casual. And I realized that that's the difference. There's a, dif there's a clear difference between how chill people are. You know, with car shows, it's all businessmen meeting each other. And, and here, it's very casual. I, I think one of my favorite things that I witnessed this year, and you were with me, at the Royal Enfield stand, it was the first press conference of the day. And as soon as it was over, the Biggest people from Ducati, Claudio Domenicali, uh, Giulio Fabri, Francesco Milicia, who heads their global sales, they were all there and they were all looking at Royal Enfield's bikes and one of their old colleagues now works with Royal Enfield who has the electric project. Mario Alvisi. Mario Alvisi. And they were just friends excited to see each other and talk about their motorcycles and that was very cool. Rishad, that embrace, I must say, um, it's rare to see at motor shows and that... Uh, uh, attachment, that affection towards each yeah. other. I mean, Mario's just joined Royal Enfield, but a uh, decade ago, he launched the Scrambler for Correct. Ducati. Uh, and uh, you could see uh, that, you know, while uh, uh, Domenicali's protege might have moved on to Royal Enfield, but uh, the um, the love for each other and the respect towards each other, I, it was phenomenal. Like you said, it was the first uh, uh, exhibition of the day, I mean, first uh, press conference of the day, and to see the entire top management out there spending time and now it was amazing to see uh, uh, just the energy. You know, I mean, you, there's so much of positivity around it and there's so much of exchange of information. There's genuine respect for each other. I remember at the Hero press conference much later in the day, Sid Lal was just sitting amongst the journalists, just watching the press conference, watching Dr. Pan Munjal and, and you know, it, it was it's great to see. And I think for me, one of the big highlights of this year's ICMA is that India was out there. This was our ICMA. This was the most relevant ICMA for India by far. Pretty much every mid-capacity exciting bike out there was made in India. Absolutely. Uh, we had uh, KTMs, we had the BMWs, we had the Royal Enfields. So that was fabulous. And uh, uh, I can't agree more, uh, Rishad. In fact, uh, I remember attending the ICMA almost a decade back. And at that point in time, we did have stalls from Royal Enfield and uh, Hero. Uh, but at that point in time, it just seemed as if, you know, they're trying to make their presence felt. But this time around, 
it just seemed like they belonged there yeah. you know it just it just the, the confidence level was uh, of a different magnitude uh, the product portfolio that was on showcase i mean that was so relevant and clearly both the companies um, while we did have other indian top management visiting the show and we did uh, see presence like you mentioned of uh, tvs manufactured bike and bajaj manufactured bike in uh, in aikma but just the fact that you know we as uh, indian motorcycle maker we have now elevated ourselves to the next level and we can now compete with the big boys in fact the big boys are looking at our our kind of market which is the mid-size motorcycle as you mentioned and it's just amazing to see the confidence it's just amazing to see the products as to how they stand out uh, in a really massive ex exposition where over 2000 bikes are showcased and you know what is also amazing you just read up on the web about uh, the highlights of the show and it's amazing to see how royal and free creeps up again and again so clearly i mean the product portfolio is getting expanded uh, they're being relevant for the uh, global markets and it's it's really heartening to see as an indian journalist to see the rise of indian two wheeler brands mind you they are uh, they are uh, fed of uh, the indian two wheeler makers are the biggest brand ambassador globally in terms of make in india i mean our bikes are appreciated in africa latin america but now you see them you know fighting with big boys in europe and us i think that's a matter of pride for me okay let's start with these bikes that we are talking about royal enfield first show of the day the ev got very mixed responses there is the indian crowd who thinks that a royal enfield is a bullet yeah they were not happy yeah. a lot of them were not happy and then there was the other side of people who said wow that's cool and i definitely belong on the other side because i think with today's ev technology you cannot make a conventional motorcycle if you try to do that you're going to end up with a flawed product that's too heavy does not have the range blah 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 we've discussed this i think the way royal enfield has done this is right they have embraced old school and they've brought in future cool as well so there's they've brought back a girder front fork i don't think anyone's made a bike with that front suspension design in 50 70 years wow but they're doing it in entire aluminum they have redesigned the concept it's their own concept but it's a statement that entire bike is this skinny slim thing but it to me it is a it's an accessory it's a it's a it's a lifestyle accessory i would see people who aren't into motorcycles someone who doesn't want to deal with a you know a big heavy oily yeah. loud hot running thing someone who's not from that generation but who wants a, a cool commuter absolutely i think that bike can speak to those people what do you think i think uh, i agree with you completely and in fact uh, uh, we often talk about re 2.0 re 3.0 we've discussed in royal enfield post podcast as well in the past clearly uh, you know the company needs to reinvent itself when it's looking at the future and what what was amazing to me is it dipped into its history yeah. you know the flying flea concept uh, the motorcycle that was dropped from the aircraft during the world war 2 i mean what a halo story behind that and uh, you make it relevant to the audience which is young uh, which is looking for something different and uh, sidlal was very clear when he uh, unveiled the motorcycle that you know this is the beginning of the next chapter for uh your royal and fila it is going to take the company uh, well ahead for the next 25 years and uh, we've seen the way uh, sadat lal you know he looks at the future i mean uh, even b govind rajan keeps uh, uh, you know reiterating that you know they are a long term aggressive company so clearly they think long term yeah and i think it's a beautiful start according to me and and it had to be a different form factor Correct. yes definitely for uh, uh, the current set of audience and the current uh, set of royal and field lovers it is something that they would not have imagined uh, but uh, I, i mean i had a great time talking to mario alvisi about you know what does he think about uh, uh, reimagining royal and field in an electric avatar and and clearly there are amazing ideas on the table and you have to think differently and what they've come out with you i mean the first two concepts uh, they're stunning according to me the good news is that that's not royal enfield saying hey look we're going electric deal with it no the combustion engine bikes continue oh, yes. they're developing them there's 750 coming in about a year there's 440 coming next year we know these things and these bikes are here to stay yeah. for as long as they can right royal enfield is not saying sorry people go electric but they're embracing the future they're developing for that future they're preparing themselves so that future when it arrives and no, what that's the right way to do it you know what amazes me about this company is that there are multiple parallel tracks Uh, which are operating in the backdrop and they are never in a hurry as journalist as especially as a business journalist you know we keep asking them about the growing competition and pressure from the competition but every single time i come back convinced that 
uh, the company and Sadat Lal is very convinced about the path that they are taking. Of course, they are 89% of the market, so uh, there's he huge headroom for them to experiment. But what is amazing for me, even with regards to this motorcycle, they're not hurrying up. I mean, uh, the motorcycle is actually production ready. If they really want, they can launch it in a, in a quarter's time. But they're taking it very slow. Uh, they are uh, understanding the market. They are very keen on uh, observing the feedback that they're going to get from global audience. Uh, amazing fact, uh, Rishad, uh, the company mentioned that they've reached out to 5,000 different customers around the world. And it's rare to see, uh, I mean, this is being done by company itself rather than through an outside agency. So, I mean, when you do that, you're really keen to know what is it that the future motorcycle buyer is really looking to buy. And it's the process that uh, the company has put in place is, is what gives me conviction. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited about it. Uh, clearly, you know, this is the beginning. Uh, on that flying flea concept itself, Mario told us that there could be four to five different iterations of it. And that is just the first platform. Uh, and, and we've spoken about it in the past that electric vehicle lineup is going to be big. And uh, while they've not revealed details, but uh, it is going to deliver power of 60 to 120 volt. Uh, I mean, it's it's phenomenal for that kind of size yeah. bike, and, and 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 this is just the start. And they want to do a lot more performing uh, a bike in the future. So I'm quite excited, and right. I, I mean, and and I believe in the thought process that uh, the company has taken at this point in time. Yeah. While Flying Flea hogged the limelight at Royal and Field Stall, uh, but which are the other bikes that you are really excited about? I mean, there's a bevy of new launches that we've seen, and there are many more coming. Uh, Hi. Yeah, yeah, from Royal and Field. Uh, well, what excites you about their future lineup? Uh, I think the Bear 650 will be the nicest of the 650s. I have not ridden it, but just by concept of what it is, little more suspension travel, a uh, little more finish, a uh, nicer finish than Interceptor. I find many of the 650s to be compromised bikes. Uh, they have uncomfortable suspension, or the riding positions don't work, or the bike is too long and heavy and wide. The Bear takes care of many of those things. It doesn't have wide exhaust sticking out. Uh, Siddesh, who's standing behind the camera, they used to own an Interceptor, and he told me one very interesting thing that he, he he would park his bike in traffic and a car would nudge him from the back. Oh. Because the exhaust sticks out like this and <laughs> the car guy does not expect an exhaust to be there. He exists in exam. You know how Bombay everyone is, uh, Mumbai yeah. everyone is so closely packed. So uh, these are small compromises on the 650 platform that are not easy to fix. That's what the platform is. But the bear addresses many of them. So yeah. to me, that is the most exciting one for now. I am really looking forward to the 440 uh, Scram next year because I think RE should not step away from their air-cooled heritage. Right. They only have one thumper, slow-revving, air-cooled single cylinder right now. Sure. It needs to be more than that. And sure. the 440 Scram hopefully will be in that direction. And I'm very excited about the 750. Uh, we've broken that story a long time ago. Our it's platform. in development, it's out testing, it should be ready in a year's time. And I think that bike will offer a good jump up in performance over the current Interceptor take the power from 47 horsepower, maybe to 60, 60 plus, maybe somewhere there, which bridges the gap to the Bonnevilles. Uh, uh, they will still be more premium motorcycles, but now you're getting similar levels of performance for much less money, and uh, that's, the, that's the next exciting thing that Ari is doing. They, they, they introduced us to affordable twin cylinder engines, and now they're introducing us to affordable 50, 60 horsepower performance. Uh, fantastic. Uh, sorry, if I were to kind of take you back to that Himalayan test bed, you know, I mean, while Flying Flea was uh, what was the highlight of the show, but do you think that an AV in that form factor, I mean, while uh, Sidlal did allude to the fact that, you know, it's still a test bed and they uh, are, you know, gaining a lot of insight from the uh, testing that, uh, of that motorcycle, but in that form factor, do you think an AV makes sense? Uh, I don't. You don't think so? The Himalayan test bed is very well named. It is a test bed. Yeah. And they are out hammering it and they're testing it hard and they're learning things. But I think it should stay a test bed because I don't believe an adventure motorcycle can be electric with today's technology. Sure. Sure, when we have widely available fast charging, why not? Lovely. But I don't want to deal with waiting for hours every few hours. You know? I get it. I get it. When I'm out touring and I, I don't want the weight associated with that on an electric bike and if it's if it's got the range, it's got the weight. If it doesn't have the weight, it doesn't. Uh, the usual stuff. So, so you think that the segment needs to mature a little bit more before the we start. The technology needs to. Be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We need yeah. breakthroughs in technology. They're going to come. Yeah, but we need to wait for right. those kind of things. Right. I right. Absolutely. For me, the other big Indian presence was Hero. Yes, definitely. I have seen Hero stand go from this little thing in the corner. Oh, world's the largest two billion manufacturer we sell, but the Europeans aren't really interested in right. in this, and now they've gotten. Bigger stands, bigger crowds, and again, more Europe-relevant products. So they had four, 
Yes. Big launches this year. Yes. And the good news is that unlike last year, these are actually going to come to the market very soon. Last time, no more concepts. Yeah, last time around they showed two scooters that haven't come yet. I understand there's some engine development things that are happening. And to be honest, I appreciate them taking their time rather than putting out a flawed product and then dealing with all of the negativity that comes with that. Take your time. With these products, the new Charisma 250, the Extreme 250, the Xpulse 210, I understand production has already begun or yes. is beginning and they're going to be rolling out in the coming months. So that is the good news at the start. No, absolutely. I, I think and uh, they've stayed the path. Uh, Hero Motor Corp has announced it clearly that they want to be a lot more active in the premium end of the market. And uh, we saw a proof of that at EICMA. And uh, they're going to be entering the European market. I mean, clearly, uh, they have spent the last two, three years getting the bikes right uh, for that market. Global expansion has been part of their thought process ever since they parted ways with Honda. Uh, but, you know, getting into evolved markets, it takes... Uh, uh, you've got to build capabilities in-house. You've got to have bikes that can challenge or rather at least carve a space for yourself in a um, really competitive and uh, very loyalty-driven market. So I think, um, again, to me, um, what what was amazing to see was the confidence and the size of the stall was one thing to see. And I mean, if uh, at the beginning of the day you saw Dominic Ali spending time with Siddharth Lal, uh, later part of the day, uh, you know, I mean, uh, I think it was... Uh, in the evening around 5 o'clock, you, you, I mean, you could see, uh, uh, or it was later day, second, second day, I think, Dominic Ali did spend almost about 45 minutes to an hour with Dr. Pawn Manjal as well. And uh, apart from the bikes, uh, what also caught attention was that surge to come three-wheeler. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that also speaks about uh, uh, the volumes or the fact that, you know, Indian uh, vehicle makers are willing to think out of box. Yeah. You know, I mean, your video generated phenomenal views when you yeah. first posted that search concept. Million people. Yeah, that was phenomenal. Because no one's done this before. Yeah, phenomenal concept. I mean, a unique concept where a two-wheeler can become a three-wheeler. And uh, there was a lot of uh, interest, a lot of attention. So clearly, I mean, uh, we can definitely see, uh, you know, the confidence is growing. And uh, it is reflecting on the stands in the products. And the surge actually goes on sale in 2025. They've gone through the process of creating new legal framework. What category does it come under? L2, L5? L25, all, yeah. All, all that is in place now. So it's not just this cool concept that Hero said, look, we can make this. They're going forward, they're bringing it to the market. You know, that's another thing, no, Rishad? I mean, uh, make in India for the world. Yeah. I mean, uh, clearly in the two-wheeler space, Indians have definitely edged ahead of Chinese. Yeah. Um, yeah, in the car space, it's a different story. But Indian brands are revered for their quality, for their reliability, for their value proposition. And uh, Indian brands are the only ones that are challenging Japanese um, in Africa and Latin America. And um, and no, no surprises that you have the Europeans and Americans wanting to tie up with the Indian brands. And um, I mean, let me uh, bring you another alliance, uh, uh, Zero Motorcycle. Uh, Zero has uh, a partnership with Zero Motorcycle. Happened to sp uh, spend time with uh, Sam there, the CEO of uh, Zero. Absolutely excited about India. Absolutely, absolutely excited about the alliance that they have with Hero, and they are quite kicked about manufacturing motorcycles in India for the world. Uh, yes, the timeline for launch of Zero motorcycle is not yet known, but uh, he, uh, Sam, in fact, mentioned for him the Hero partnership is probably amongst the strongest that he has, and he has huge faith on India. So you know, you are seeing uh, uh, validation, and you are seeing recognition of Indian brands from global CEOs, and that's a great sign for me to see. I have some friends who I spoke to who gave me a little bit of insight into the Zero Motorcycle. So they're developing something specially for us. Yes. And they're excited about what they're working on. They say that it's going to be lighter than the competition. They they know what's out there right now. And they are excited about what that Zero Motorcycle will be. I think 2026 is when we should see it, the Made in India bike. Uh, yes, you're right. Yeah. Uh, out of the 18 months, yeah. uh, but you know, because it's a different concept, yeah. they want to be, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, it's a different concept, they want to, they want to be short, right. uh, uh, but uh, clearly, at the Zero uh, motorcycle stand, you did see a uh, series of bikes which are more accessible in nature, right. and uh, by accessibility, they mean lighter as well as affordable, uh, and uh, they think that, you know, who better than Hero to work with from a manufacturing capability perspective, supply chain perspective, so, um, in fact, 26 may be the start and then from there on you want to see portfolio which is going to cater to the larger part of the market and uh, and I mean clearly for the world's largest motorcycle maker I I mean the pivot towards EV can definitely happen with zero in uh, in a good uh, manner talking of products uh, uh, Rishad uh, you know why don't you uh, help us understand what excited you at hero hero uh, the 250 engine is very interesting 
uh, they've taken the 210 which is in the charisma they've stroked it out so it's not a bigger ball but it's it's uh, it's gone in the direction of a bigger stroke also changes in terms of cams and things like that and i like that engine i like the concept of the engine because it should be a more rideable thing rather than a very top end focused thing which is the 210 that's in the new charisma 250 that's in the extreme uh, also big credit for the design teams they nailed it with the extreme 125 yeah. that bike is flying it could take over the raiders uh, business it could be number one in that segment wow. it's doing really well for hero do you hear that yeah because it looks so special yeah. and i think they've achieved that with the extreme 250 as well it's a big muscular looking motorcycle what i'm a little bit confused by is hero's confusion with their product lineup Now they have a Expulse 210. Yeah. Why isn't it an Expulse 250? If the Expulse 210 was replacing the old Expulse 200, I understand it's a small jump up. It should not be True. a big jump in terms of price. But the 200 is going to continue. Right. So you got the 220 horsepower. Now you got this 210 at 24 horsepower. Why wasn't it a 250? That's all the confusion. The 250 engine would have been a better match to the Expulse because that 210 just wakes up at 6,000 RPM. Right. And that's not what I want in an Expulse. Right. First confusion. The second confusion is the new Expulse 210, the Extreme 250, and the Charisma 210. Right. Get TFT displays as options on the Charisma 210 with a USD fork, but the Charisma 250 comes with an LCD. Wow. <laughs> so if I buy the 250 Charisma, I get an LCD dash, and if I buy the 210 Charisma top model, I can get a TFT dash. TFT. These are certain confusions that I think just it's not necessary. Right. Have a clean lineup. the better bike the bigger bike gets the better stuff maybe it's meant for different markets then or maybe but why don't i mean i'm sure there'll be a charisma 250 with a tft especially when people like me and others are going to talk yeah. about this absolutely. you know why not absolutely or why not at the start absolutely nevertheless uh, i'm excited about their new engine hero has proven themselves when it comes to chassis design they some of the best handling bikes in the market good suspension setups that's nailed design is coming to the fore now they're finding their own identity uh, they're doing well there engines have been a bit of a struggle uh long term refinement it's the reason why the scooters like yeah. i mentioned are a little delayed yeah and this is the next step that we need to see in terms of really solid feeling engines and i'm hoping that 250 shows us a step in that direction right i mean that's the art that uh, they need to uh, master given the fact that their reliance on honda was so phenomenal over the years right. and uh, probably alliance with the harley there will help them in some uh, form or the other but clearly engine is one area that they'll have to uh, kind of get to the next level you know ketan one of the things i liked about aikma this year was that there was a balance between ev and combustion it was oh, yes. just focused on only one and saying you know everyone's panicked and making only ev or everyone's abandoning ev and only doing ic right. there were some interesting ev concept uh, concepts re being one zero uh, yes. hero had its own stuff there was a new vida there There was also those Husqvarna and KTM dirt bikes as electric dirt bikes are awesome because they're Phenomenal. light they're very fast yeah. and for the average rider you will be exhausted before the battery is exhausted absolutely so it makes sense but at the same time there was some really interesting combustion stuff happening that did you see the Honda concept oh man i mean i was shocked to see a three cylinder yeah. uh, concept yeah um and we also saw a concept uh, from CF Moto a yeah. four cylinder yeah. so clearly i mean uh, internal combustion engine uh, has a much much long uh, future uh, ahead um, and uh, you are seeing uh, vehicle makers reinventing themselves and coming out with latest technology um, so i'm quite excited about uh, you know seeing a, a, a really nice mix of expressive ice two wheelers as well as a really unique concept in electric car uh, market right. I I I love what Honda has done because for me there are two Hondas that have historically existed. There is one Honda that has been the boring traditional oh we will give you a superbly refined very well engineered product that will last probably longer than you will the most exciting bike so. Then there is Honda who has done the maddest engineering ever oval piston engines and you know race bikes which have the exhausts coming up and over the engine and the fuel tank somewhere else. They've done some amazing stuff. Believe you me, I'm getting goosebumps as you're saying it. I mean, that stall was just phenomenal. It was huge. Yeah. And the kind of bikes that I saw there, I'm like, why aren't we getting them in India? And some really phenomenal stuff. I mean, Europeans were gorging over it. And uh, I mean, I was just in amaze yeah. uh, to see the kind of portfolio that we saw from Honda there. We know that they, here in India also they're going to be pivoting uh, towards uh, more mid-size motorcycle. You're going to see more 250 cc, 300 cc, 500 cc in the future. Uh, but uh, just to look at the flavor, form, 
and the crowd oh my god i mean everyone was so uh, i mean that 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 stall despite being massive in proportion it was really crowded is also because this v3 is just unbelievable you don't expect in today's era someone to engineer something so out of the box two cylinders in the front one at the back electric compressor it looks like a turbo but it doesn't function like a turbo so we'll call it an electrically controlled compressor it's going to take time the japanese take their time with things absolutely but it's coming and there's something exciting unique never seen before in this form at least coming out fantastic they also had an electric scooter oh yes yeah. oh yes oh yes and uh, of course uh, later in uh, later this month uh, we are likely likely to see a premiere of that and uh, how closely do you think they're related what was that icma and what's coming to india well the uh, what what i understand is that uh, the basic framework of how that scooter was designed um, yeah india has borrowed a lot from that right. of course you going to uh, adapt it and design it to meet the nuances of the indian buyer and at the same time the cost factor is going to be different so you're going to have a lot more of local content and maybe the body shell is going to be a little different but I'm sure the design of, will be unique to us yeah yeah yeah, yeah yeah absolutely absolutely but beyond that scooter which was uh, you know kept in one part of the hall there were two concepts as well right. uh, which were uh, radical and looked amazing um, and, and 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 clearly uh, there are different form of electric vehicle expression honda seeing and they have decided that they want to be electric vehicle leader by 2040 uh, and 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 they're looking at millions of bikes of course india is still a small market given the fact that the indian market is still very small and they're taking a slow measure approach unlike pvs and bajaj auto but quite exciting to see uh, the kind of scooters and motorcycles that they're coming out with and um, many people say that uh, yes uh, when the japanese enter Uh, the electric vehicle yeah. market the the dynamics will completely change because for them the core is reliability and performance yeah. um and uh, not to say that uh, our, our home grown brands are any less but given the fact that it just adds a little bit of spice and competitiveness uh, in the market which will ensure that the products that an indian buyer gets will be phenomenal so honda's electric scooter launches i think on the 27th of this month yes now i am very intrigued about this for a few reasons the first is The Japanese have traditionally shown that they don't think performance is so important for an EV. They think that going by the data, customers tend to use maximum 20 to 30 kilometers a day. They don't tend to go very quickly in the city. So an EV with a range of 50 to 60 kilometers and top speed of 50 to 60 kilometers yeah. is good enough. That I don't think is going to work in India, and I think Honda is aware of that. So I think it needs to be beyond that. But the second thing is, did you check that scooter? You you saw the scooter at I. Yes. There was no storage space. Yeah once the batteries are in there there is no storage space you maybe put a file or something on top yeah so uh, like you uh, benches uh, uh, rishad you know i think uh, there are multiple uh, concepts that are under works right now yeah. uh, you know uh, we've reported in the past about a couple of concepts that they are working on uh, we've seen how bajaj is trying to create that space in its uh, a scooter right now and uh, clearly i think uh, this is just the start what we are going to see on 27th uh, beyond that there are many such projects under work um, you know i mean just to say that projects are called gjna and k4ba yeah. you know i mean these are the man with the course he knows <laughs> them all <laughs> you know i mean they've been working at it uh, again and again i mean uh, uh, very vigorously and uh, again the good part about them is that they want to be really short before they launch the product so yes you can say that they are conservative uh, they may not be um, you know in terms of uh, uh delivering a uh, range of performance uh, the best but in terms of reliability i do expect them to deliver the best yeah. so we had a few other indian international brand partnership products there we had the tono we uh, our tono 457 yes. uh, made in baramati exciting product we had the 390 ktm off road bikes there yeah. unfortunately they didn't share the details they said it'll come early next year but we got to see that adventure and it looks really really capable i Amazing. hope bajaj brings the entire range to india they will have a lower seat height version with an 820 mm seat height smaller wheels for india oh, wow that's fine do it and that will also be a fairly capable bike but i really hope they also bring the r because people the market deserves it there's also the smc which is a uh, enduro bike with small wheels which i think will be phenomenal in a city like mumbai yeah, because you have amazing. suspension travel and agility and that's lightweight amazing. it'll be excellent there's the enduro So lots of exciting stuff from them. Uh, Ultra Violet was there. They showed oh, yes. a road focused version of the F77 which is going to make sense because I really like the F77 but I don't want to deal with that discomfort especially on bad roads. That new bike that they showcased 
really solves potentially a lot of those issues. Uh, absolutely. In fact, Rishad, I did get to spend time with both Narayan and Neeraj. And uh, I mean, the confidence level again there is phenomenal uh, for a startup to be out there at ICMA and wanting to sell in Europe. Uh, clearly, there's a lot of belief and conviction within them. And uh, uh, the bike is a stunner. And uh, it definitely uh, attracted a lot of eyeballs at the at the motor show. I mean, while I was waiting to interview both of them, Neeraj and Narayan, uh, there were uh, so many dealers wanting to take up uh, uh, the dealership for Ultraviolet. Uh, and they've been at it for the last seven years. And uh, like uh, both Neeraj and Narayan mentioned, this is the time for them to take off. So uh, clearly, I mean, um, uh, you know, the aspiration that they have, they want to be known as the most advanced motorcycle maker in the world. For a startup to have that big, hairy, audacious goal, um, it's amazing. And as to, I mean, they they worked hard at it. I mean, and they, they engineered it. And it's amazing. Full I mean, to them. I mean, and 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 Rashad, the the story behind bringing in the aerospace engineers, uh, defense engineers to get everything right, uh, they be slow slow off the mark. Uh, but uh, I mean, it gives me uh, a lot of joy in saying that the bikes appear to be ready now, yeah. and uh, I am really excited to see how the Indian buyers uh, react, you know, to react to it. And and either just telling me this you know, demand or uh, excitement from uh, a small town uh, in India, in Orissa, Bhuvaneshwar to Guatemala. So, uh, you know, clearly it is uh, drawing attention of uh, prospective buyers around the world. And I'm quite excited to see uh, how Ultraviolet, um, you know, gets to the next phase. There are, I mean, you saw a concept there uh, as well, uh, which could probably make it into the Indian market. They want to expand their uh, product portfolio and they're also gunning for the record of the fastest Indian motorcycles very soon. Yeah. Uh, so, so, I mean, clearly there's a lot of uh, conviction, faith and uh, I mean, that uh, belief was quite infectious and I must say that. I got to say though, the surprise and probably the highlight of the show for me was the BMW 450. Oh, yes. So I'm on running around from stall to stall. We've got a press conference scheduled to follow. And I tell the guys in the office, please let me know if I'm missing something. And they said, can you go shoot the BMW 450 GS? What? <laughs> <laughs> and then we saw what we saw. Isn't it amazing as to, that's the beauty of TVS Motor, isn't it? Quietly, I mean, come out with they stuff. They keep their stuff under the covers. Uh, they really manage it. Uh, come out with stuff. No one knows about it. Quietly do their job and come out with some amazing yeah. motorcycle. That's the reason why, you know, you see this TVS BMW partnership doing really well. Of course, it's a BMW bike and uh, uh, we think it's got to be manufactured in India. It's such a proud moment to see such kind of bikes being made in India. And um, it's phenomenal as to how, again, I see how big European brands wanting to veer to towards yeah. mid-sized motorcycle. Clearly, Royal Enfield has shown them the path that uh, there is that, uh, um, you know, uh, an end of the market where a lot of youth uh, is looking for an expressive bike. So I think I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to see as to when it comes into the production mode, uh, hits the global market and hopefully India soon. fairly production ready. I think different headlamp, different tail section, but the engine looks pretty much set. And they haven't told us too much about the engine, but we know it's 48 horsepower and we know it's a unique firing order, which is nice because everyone's doing 270 degree firing orders. They all sort of sound the same. Right. This is going to be different. Like it or not, it's going to be different. Uh, I think that's a good step. And you know, this leads nicely into this conglomeration between what India wants and what the world is going to need soon. I think mid-sized motorcycles are the future. Right. It's awesome to have 30,000 pound Panigales and GS adventures, but that market, I don't know how long it's going to last. Economic issues all around the world. Absolutely. Uh, people don't have spare money to spend. It's not looking like it's going to get any better anytime soon. Mid-sized motorcycles are here to rule and beautifully, most of them are made in India. Fantastic, isn't yeah. it? And I had an opportunity to uh, interview Nick Bloor as well mm. over there, a Triumph Motorcycle. Uh, you know, he uh, told us that how uh, the partnership is really uh, evolving into one of its strong pillars. And uh, believe you me, India is very soon going to be the largest market for Triumph. Um, and, and, and clearly it has happened because of its alliance with Bajaj. And uh, Nick was very effusive about how great the relationship with Bajaj is. And right. one can expect many more motorcycles in the future. So there, there's another, uh, you know, British brand uh, which has conviction towards that mid-sized motorcycle that you're talking about. And it's amazing to see whenever you travel overseas and you see, even on motorbans, you see mid-sized motorcycle. It's amazing to see a Royal Enfield being ridden on those roads. And I mean, um, like a, a, you know, curious... Uh, Indian bike lover, you would just take you out a camera. That? Yeah, oh yes, oh yes. So many interceptors are in Milan right now. It's, like, it's phenomenal, and I mean, you get uh, you, your heart swells with pride, and you want to take pictures and video. 
I mean, so clearly, like you said, uh, uh, the European buyer, the global buyer is moving towards mid-sized motorcycle. And I think uh, Europeans have uh, got the formula right by partnering, I mean, BMW partnering TVS. And we know how successful KTM Husqvarna has been with Bajaj Auto. And they're moving from strength to strength. You know, I mean, and I, and I do expect a lot more coming in the future. At the same time, I think we should also be aware that we can't just sit on our, rest on our laurels because China has stepped its game up. There are a couple of manufacturers, particularly CF Moto, who yes. are doing some fantastic stuff. I've spoken to engineers from Indian companies who say nobody is doing quality in certain things like switch gear and all at the moment like CF Moto. Their engines are fantastic. Their KTM connection has helped them a lot. I rode a couple of CF Moto 650s a few years ago in India. They were definitely the best Chinese bike I'd ever ridden, but they weren't so nice overall. Today, things have changed. No. And we need to be aware that it's not just us who is who is catering to this segment and I absolutely agree. Up. You know, I absolutely agree. I mean, we've had many such brands, car brands coming out of China, but then you have the BYD, yeah. right? Who knows, CF Moto could be that yeah. BYD of uh, uh, the motorcycle uh, market in the world. And, and and I was amazed to see that four-cylinder bike. And uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, it, it is amazing to see the crowd. I mean, one of the easiest thing to know where the excitement is, you see where the crowd is swelling up. And... Uh, I mean, there's so much of uh, reverence for the brand, even on the web when you read about them. So, uh, yes, competition's there. And uh, the good part about competition is that uh, in India, we have intense competition. The enthusiast uh, yeah. benefits at the end. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and that is, to me, the you know, the biggest revealing factor is the kind of motorcycles that I saw there. I mean, clearly, for uh, all these brands, India is an important market uh, by the virtue of being the la largest ICE two-wheeler market in the world. So you're going to see many of them coming into India. I, in fact, I would want to ask you about Suzuki Motorcycle. Mm. They also had their 400cc. 400, 400, yeah. 400 Again, yet another company, uh, you know, quietly working, uh, but, uh, you know, creating uh, the islands of excellences. I mean, uh, the Bergman was one, the Axis is another. Um, there's a Bergman EV being spoken yeah. of, and uh, that 400cc motorcycle will be interesting from India perspective as well. I'm not sure about that 400cc bike for India because there are a few questions. First of all, they've not had great success with their motorcycles. Their scooters are yeah. stars, but their 250 platform has not done too much yeah. for them. They're working hard. It's a great platform. Yeah. But, you know, in terms of sales, not so much. The 400 engine for India is fantastic. It makes sense, fantastic. But it also depends on how, uh, how much they can localize it. Yeah. If they put that investment into localization, can they export from here? Yeah. Because that's going to be very important for them. Yeah. So all that has to fall into place before that bike comes into India. Does it make sense for us? Absolutely. Yes. And they could use it for many things. Yes. But will it happen? I guess we'll have to wait. Yeah, so the sense I'm getting, Rishat, and uh, we've seen it uh, over the last few years with Suzuki Motorcycle brand, that uh, you know, growing from strength to strength volumes, India, again, the biggest market for Suzuki globally. Um, and we are seeing global projects being brought into India. So clearly, yes, given the fact that volumes in India are still very low for that kind of uh, form factor. Right. Uh, uh, yes, of course, we have the likes of Classic and all in large numbers, but with the kind of form factor that Suzuki is looking at, uh, the volumes are still very low. But yes, you, it's going to be a global project if it makes it into the Indian market. I, I sense that the project will be uh, relevant for the Indian market and they may produce it in India for the world market. Fantastic. I hope you're right. Yeah. Uh, out of the brand, Rishad, what I feel uh, is barely spoken of is Aprilia. Uh, uh, you know, what do you think of them and the endeavors that they've had? You're very uh, gungo about the bikes, Aprilia bikes that are there in the market. And what do you think of the Tuono? Aprilia makes some of the best motorcycles on the planet. The RSE for 2 date is, wow, the best big bike I've ridden. Uh, not the fastest, maybe not how the new one is, but it's just, there's something about the way those bikes ride, their engines, the way they handle, unbelievable. Uh, the RS457 distilled that down into an accessible package, which is why I and so many people really, really like that bike. But it's uncomfortable by nature of what it is. Right. The Tuono promises to fix that. I am a little disappointed in the Tuono's design because it's a naked bike. It's not a Tuono. A Tuono is supposed to be a half-fed bike with a bit of a windscreen and the same headlight setup. Uh, now, some people will argue that, oh, it reminds of the true Tuono from 2005. But the RS-457 doesn't remind of the RS-V from 2005. Right. It should have looked like its bigger siblings. Especially when the Tuono 125 internationally has the correct design. Right. Why they have done this, I don't know. Because to do tooling and uh, completely redesign a new headlamp is not cheap. Right. It may have been as cost-effective to just create a half heading. Maybe aesthetically it wasn't working. I don't know. I'm, this is something I'm keen to ask Aprilia when we ride that bike. I want an answer there. 
I'm not convinced on the way the front looks, but I am convinced that it will be a great motorcycle ride. More, maybe more accessible, you feel, in the current form factor that they've introduced uh, when compared with the previous form factor? It's used. not what a Tuono should be. A right. Tuono needs to be the a character. fed RSV4 with a flat handlebar. That is a Tuono. And right. that's why the Tuono is so unique, because it's the only naked super bike or super naked that gives you some wind protection. Right. The rest of them are completely naked. So that that's the appeal in a Tuono. And this 457 doesn't have it. Very right, exciting conversation, Rishad. I had a ball uh, understanding the two-wheeler world a little bit more intimately. So, thank you very much for your insights. Yeah, it was great having you at ICMA because you approach the show from a very different perspective. Uh, oh, absolutely. I I'm all about the product. You're all about the stories behind the product and the business. And right, it's, it's phenomenal to see at the end of the day there are stories uh, for investors, there are stories for uh, the shareholders, yeah. consumers, uh, competition. Um, it's a completely different uh, uh, lens through which you see and... Yeah. Uh, uh, at the end of the day, you know, it's all about product and you get excited with product. So it was phenomenal to see the show from uh, various different... I think to end, I want to just be grateful for the fact that Aikma is doing well. Yeah. Car shows around the world are dying. They don't make sense anymore. Blah, blah, blah. Aikma had the biggest footfall ever this year. Yeah. Over half a million people. Every big brand was there after yes. a few years of the pandemic of, you know, BMW not being there and so and so not being there. Everyone was there. Right. Uh, some crazy statistics... Something like 7,000 different uh, brands were on display. And it's not just motorcycles, it's apparel, it's accessories. We had some Indian brands too. There were Indian brands. TVS Eurogrip was there. They launched their new Trailhound Adventure Tires. Uh, there was Blue Armor who makes the Bluetooth headsets. They were there, they're looking at new business partnerships. They already have business partnerships with TVS and Royal Enfield. Right. Uh, I think Vega Helmets was there with yes. their Axor brands. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. It's, it's, good, it's good to see not just motorcycles in terms of partnerships with big international brands. But India, the whole ecosystem is, as a whole, we have representation at ICMA. ICMA is doing well. I'm just happy that it exists. Thank God it's there every year. We get to go visit it, uh, soak in the experience. And I would like to say to all our viewers as well, you may not be there for business purposes. It's worth going there for a holiday. I mean, it's, make ICMA a part of your holiday. It's a fantastic experience. I think we can wrap it up on that note. Absolutely. That's our podcast for the week. We are out every week, same time next week. Look out for the next one.